Today, August 25th, 2020, I, Maya Hill, the interviewer, will be interviewing Mr. William Collins over Zoom. The title of the project that we will be doing this interview for is the Black Student Alumni Oral History Project. So welcome, Mr. William Collins. Collins. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to just dive in into the, the some of the questions that I have for you about your time at Penn State. Um, Mr. William, yeah. William Collins is from the class of 1969 at the Pennsylvania State University. Um, so where and when were you born? Uh, I was born in Philadelphia in uh, 1947, May 12, 1947. Um, can you tell us about how, like, how you grew up? What was your family dynamic like? Um, oh, yeah. What were some of the things yeah. that you experienced in your neighborhood or your city? Um, especially during a heightening time of, you know, the civil rights movement and, and several other um, racial tensions that were persisted in um, that time. Okay. Um, well, um, I grew up uh, initially in West Philly. We lived in an apartment above a store. And uh, in about 1950, uh, 54, 55, we moved to a housing project in North Philly. It was called the Raymond the Raymond Rosen Project, R O S E N. High rises and low rises. It's gone now. And after you know, and I went to public school and I went to Catholic school. Um, parents kind of thought that Catholic schools were more strict and more likely to provide you with a education. The, even back then, the public schools in our community were like, were like, well, wanting. Uh, then we moved to East Germantown, which is where I spent my childhood. Working class community, lower middle class, changing from Irish to black. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much, uh, the, uh, uh, the reception from the Irish was really not good. Um, and so uh, they pretty much were pretty hostile. We pretty much had our social thing, and and I would just on a on a daily basis wish that they would all move. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would get fights and stuff with them, but once they moved out, we became predominantly black. I was happy. Uh, I went to elementary school uh, right across the street. Um, um, and um, the, the ironic thing about that was um, there were always things that were in sort of like uh, 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 little boxes. There was a, you know, if I wanted to be an altar boy or choir boy, they wouldn't, mm -hmm. they wouldn't let us black kids do that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if they were going to do a, an advanced thing to try to talk to kids who they thought should go to to go to specialized high school who might go on to college. They didn't include us in uh, in fact the only time they actually had a group for the uh, for the white kids, the white boys. And the only time they had the black kids together was uh they lined us up and I guess somebody in the neighborhood and the few white families left and it said that somebody had stolen some clothes off a clothesline. So they lined up up against the wall to see if that person could identify us as stealing their clothes, which of course um, didn't happen. Um, I didn't tell my parents that until years later because I didn't want my dad to go to jail because he probably would come over to school and uh, and beat up by four or five folks. He'd have been real bad if someone had lined his son up against the wall. You know, they used to make us a uh, Catholic school. He had to wear a, a little jacket and shirt and tie and same pair of slacks. So mm -hmm. picture us all dressed up, stealing somebody's clothes off a clothesline. This is before they had the, the washers and dryers. You know, we're talking about <laughs> we're talking about the late 50s, early 60s. Yeah. So in any case, um, I went to a high school called LaSalle High School, 
Uh, there were only two, two black kids in the class, four black kids in school. Uh, I'm still on Facebook with the brother who was my classmate. Um, and pretty much, uh, uh, we were talking about it. You kind of kept your head down because the, the whites just outnumbered us. There were like 800, 800 kids. There was only four of us. Um, um, and uh, do too much hesitation. There. So out of that, uh, the kids in the class, I mean, pretty much they, they, uh, they treated me fairly well. I, uh, I knew that some of them were racist, but I never got any direct racism directed at me or at Owen, the other guy. But I knew that, uh, 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 at least not from the, at least not from the students. So the first month I was there, the uh, uh, the vice the vice principal, whom uh, one of the older black kids had told me that Rick, uh, this guy is racist. That guy suspended me my first month there. And so uh, I had to bring my dad up, and that wasn't much fun because my dad was a pretty serious guy. And so he wanted to know what I'd done. And I hadn't done anything, but then I found out that the vice principal uh, didn't like black kids. And later on, I found out from uh, from Owen that uh, I guess uh, he'd come to one of the dances and brought a, a light-skinned sister there, light-skinned black girl. And the vice principal thought it was a white girl. So he had Owen in his office to ask Owen, why did, you, why did you bring a white girl to the dance? <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So, um, you still there? Yes, I am. Hello? So, okay. Yes, I'm, I'm still okay. here. There was always kind of a duality. Um, there was that kind of culture of the Irish and Italians and Poles at school. And there were my boys who lived in the neighborhood. Now, all these guys were, well, not all, but most of them are pretty smart. And most of them could have gone on to some sort of higher education, college, trade school. But they did. Uh, they were happy to graduate from high school. They went right into the middle. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and then some of them would get higher training when they got out of the military. Um, uh, and I went on to... Uh, uh, one of the things about the high school, you got good training uh, in two things. One of them was academically. And the other was that as you saw yourself competing with the white boys, there was there was no mystery. Done. There was no feeling that, uh, yeah, there was no feeling that there was something that, that I wouldn't be qualified to do. I always thought that I could do that. And this was actually before, <laughs> before affirmative action. Um, and the ironic thing is that uh, uh, both Fred Phillips, who was a year older than me, and Owen Montague, and I, when we went to our prospective school, uh, we got active in different stuff events. I went to Penn State. That was another place where I thought there were uh, uh, more black students. Of course, there were more than my, my high school, but I wanted to get away from Philly, but not too far. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, 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 my parents drove me up there one time. When they <laughs> they drove me up there uh, when I first entered school, and then every other time I had to get the bus back or get a ride back. And mm -hmm. when I graduated, they came to pick me up. <laughs> so. <laughs> So now, uh, 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 so in, in four years, but then I was okay with that. I was okay mm -hmm. not waiting for them to come pick me up. This is a long way. Back then, Penn State, uh, the freeways that we had between Harrisburg and uh, and State College, well, that wasn't there. You had to go through every sort of smelly town, Tyrone, all those places. Uh, and so um, I lived in a dorm my first year. Um, yeah. So I, I have one 
one one question before yeah. we move into your time at Penn State. Um, yeah. Did your parents or anyone in your family attend a university or a vocational school before you, you know, you desire to go to Penn State or before you entered into college? Like, so how did possibly their experience, if they did attend a university or a, did attend um, a vocational school, kind of prepare you into going into college, like desiring to go to college? Well, well, here's the thing. Um, my 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 dad was cheated out of the GI Bill because mm-hmm. a lot of black black GIs were, and so um, one summer in '64, I went to Pittsburgh to visit some distant cousins. And Pittsburgh was a different thing. I, I hung out, but I was a you know I was a boy. I was doing my thing, but I had a cousin like a cousin three four times we moved. We went to the University of Pittsburgh. And he took me around the camp uh, and told me about what it was like for him. He played soccer on campus, and he, and he, and he had played the fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha. And so, uh, uh, and this was between my sophomore and, uh, was it between my sophomore and junior year? No. It was between my junior and senior year. Because they had a riot in Philly, 1964, and when they had the riot, I was in Pittsburgh. So my cousin Pete kind of gave me an idea about looking at college, and so uh, uh, and then uh, one of the guys who was uh, Fred, who was older than me, he told me he was going to Penn State, and so I applied to Temple and Penn and uh, Penn State and uh, LaSalle, but I really wanted to go to Penn State. And so, so uh, Pete, took, he took the day as he, as he drove me, we walked around campus, and I kind of liked the feel. I didn't want to go to Pitt, but I mm-hmm. thought I could, you know, I, you know, so I thought, you know. So in terms of my branch of the family, I would want to be the first one to go to college. You know, as you know, the, we had a, family that was spread out, and there were other branches in other cities uh, who had gone to college, uh, some of whom I had not met. But I hadn't met everybody who was in the neighborhood. There were people who worked for the city. Uh, my, my mother worked for the uh, Social Security Department, mm-hmm. and my dad worked for the he worked for the state or the city. But they were like, there were guys who were Maybe had a high school education, and my dad, mom, they supported that because they saw it as a step up. That I could get a, you know, that I could get a job and wear a shirt and stuff. Because then the, you know, because uh, let me just say you that during the summers and Christmas time, all that stuff, I I worked at factories, warehouses, department stores. I even got a job in Head Start. So I most of the time didn't work in jobs that he wore a shirt and tie. And uh, and when I was working in a box factory or an aluminum factory, uh, I quickly saw that that's not what I wanted to do, especially when I saw people get injured on the job. Yeah, it was just a means. So I worked every summer. I worked on the holidays. But uh, uh, but to go back, so that so when you know that that PD kind of gave me the idea of actually not only just going to college, but going to college away from where I was at, looking beyond you know. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Temple or whatever, or Cheney or whatever. But I I thought let me go someplace where it take me at least a, a day to get to get there. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So when you applied to Penn State, um, did you receive any type of financial aid as you, you know, applied and and after your time at Penn State or, or did you have to, you know, pay full out? Like what was, did did financial aid apply for, for you when you applied to the university? Well, um, this is what happened. Um, there was a, uh, uh, PHEAA, which was a 
Pennsylvania kind of a scholarship or a grant or something and took out a loan. My parents took out a loan, which I was going to pay back when I got out. I was going to, you know, I was going to, I was going to be the person who paid it back. So, uh, uh, at that time, uh, Penn State did not go out of its way to recruit black students. Mm -hmm. In fact, it just didn't recruit black students. Um, uh, when I arrived to the at the dorm, I remember the uh, admissions person told me, you know, I thought you were Irish. I said, oh, no. Uh, so they had no uh, they had no outreach into the into the cities, uh, not in the Harrisburg, not the Philly, you know, not Coatesville, just the none of those places, Pittsburgh, no. There were some black kids who came from Westinghouse in Pittsburgh, uh, but it wasn't like Penn State looked for them. People just got by word of mouth. So, oh, no, no. And so there were no special. So, you know, whatever whatever grants or whatever I could get. And then uh, and then uh, in terms of having spending money and stuff, um, I was, you know, I would work during the holidays and during the summer holidays. And that way I could, you know. So I lived in the dorm in West Hall, which is uh, close to the old gym. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, close to Rec Hall. Yeah, right. yeah, right Rec across Hall. from Rec Hall. So I was one of the few black kids who lived in, in, the, uh, in West Hall. Uh, I had a couple of white roommates whom I never could really get along with because uh, I like to play jazz music, <laughs> And I used to help me to study. And of course, uh, these guys were deceptively uh, square. One of them was, I could tell, uh, when they put us in the room, his name was McCarty. My name was Collins. I think they thought we were Irish Catholic. I obviously wasn't Irish. Uh, mm -hmm. And he wasn't Catholic. And he was from Norristown. This is he was from Norristown. There's a period of time when most of the people in Norristown were white. And in in I think he was pretty I think he was pretty bigoted. But in any case, I eventually got up my own room to myself and and then I started to look at the fraternity. You know, 'cause I would go to I would go to class and you'd be almost the only one in class. Almost the only black kid in class. So what was that experience like when you, being that you were the only, you know, African-American student in class, like how was that experience when you engaged with um, the faculty, um, when you engaged with other students, did you feel any form of rejection or were you welcomed into those classroom settings knowing that you were good enough to be there just like the other students? Well, well here's the thing. Remember, I'd gone to a school where I, out of, uh, in my class of, uh, you know, 260 or whatever in the freshman and sophomore, you know, my, the class of 65 high school, it was only Owen and I were the only black kids there. So I was already used to, uh, uh, so that uh, a school that had a couple hundred black kids, that was, that was like, uh, what is it? Uh, that was a hundred, that was a hundred times more than I'd ever been in school with. Plus at that time, uh, the three fraternities, we had five of the, the divine nine mm -hmm. there. Uh, uh, Omega, which was, of course, the top fraternity. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, the Kappa the and the Alpha. I first checked out the Alphas because my cousin Petey was the Alpha. But mm -hmm. I thought they were kind of square. Nice guy. <laughs> and um, and so each of the fraternities had fraternity houses. So there were three fraternity houses, and the the, the deltas and the AKs had their streets uh, at Simmons and uh, whatever the other one, Atherton, whatever. Atherton, yeah. Yeah, but, but, you know we're good. 
So they would have uh they would have, you know, mixers of parties and of course, you know, drift over there and I would meet the other brothers who are freshmen and the other folks. And so uh uh so the goal would be, you know, like you study during the week and then if they were having a party it's something at one of the frat houses and stuff, uh um then you go to that. Um, and, you know, uh, and I knew that uh, uh, within the classes where they were at that time, I had, it was years before I had a black faculty. Mm-hmm. Uh, I never had a black uh, uh, guidance counselor or whatever. Never. Um, and it was only later that I found out that during World War II or right after that, uh, or even before, black folks had built up a number of the buildings on campus. They'd come out and worked on the for the Work Progress Administration during the Depression. Uh, they built up these places, but they always acted as if uh, we were like uh, guests. Mm-hmm. I mean, we didn't even have uh, we had like one black kid on the football team, maybe a couple of black guys on the basketball team. Uh, and and women's sports were were low ball, low grade, so there weren't, weren't any sisters on any of the teams. Uh, it wasn't until Title IX came out, and then and then when women our women's team started to win stuff, so then you start to see. But this was decades later. Black women on the basketball and the, and the volleyball swim team and all that stuff. Okay. So um, mm-hmm. uh, sometimes we would, uh, you know, we meet over at the hub, hang out there. <clears throat> the hub is nowhere near fancy as the choices that you got you got now. And of <laughs> course, there was no, there was no, uh, there was no, uh, what is it, the Du Bois Center? There's no. What is oh, that? Paul oh. Robes, Paul Robeson Culture Paul Center. Paul Robeson, yeah. There was no Paul Robeson there. I mean, at that time, I didn't even know Paul Robeson was still alive in Philly at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had become so isolated and punished. He was living in North Philly. I probably passed it out, you know. Um, uh, so, for the most part, uh, go ahead. I'm just supposed to be asking no, no. questions that I'm <laughs> No, you're fine. Maybe you're, you're, you're... Maybe because Maybe because we'd already met before, so yeah. yeah. So go and ask <laughs> no. the question. No, yeah, no, no. This, this is supposed to be an interview. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're you're yeah. answering a lot of them. Um, I was just going to ask, what was your major, and how did you decide that based off of the classes that you did have access to? How did you kind of tailor your major or or your interest into one major oh. that you desired? Yeah. You know, there was there was something I left out. Um, there was a brother that lived next door to us. I always called him Mr. Bill. He was a social worker who mm-hmm. was a gang worker. He worked with gangs. Gangs were different than they have now. Uh, people was used to defend their particular territory. And and Bill, would, he would share books with me because he had graduated from the University of Scranton or, you know, one of those schools up, you know. Maybe he went to the same college that that Coach Franklin was. And he gave. Um, and so a couple of times I went with him when he was working with some of the gangs and stuff, because they were going outings and stuff. And he worked with some gangs down south Philly and whatnot. Uh, the way it was, the black uh, youth worker worked with black gangs, uh, the, the white or Italian worked with the Italian, Puerto Ricans, you know, went like that. Um, and so, and I like to read. So um, I like to read his stuff. And my dad and mom, who were like really smart people, they loved to read. And so my dad would have books on, he had a book on apartheid, uh, which is the South African uh, segregation, and then the origins of it. And uh, it was that he would like sit down and have conversations because that generation, they did. Although uh, one time when I was thought I was going to sleep in and, I was at home, and he 
insisted that I come downstairs. If you have to come downstairs and watch this man, just sit over there and don't make a lot of noise. That's mm-hmm. it. <laughs> it was Malcolm X. Malcolm X was getting him being interviewed and whatnot, and I was just fascinated. So, so, uh, uh, and you know, even though I I don't remember all the, I know what we had conversations about most stuff. The only thing he wouldn't talk about was uh, uh, was his experience during World War II. Uh, he wouldn't talk about that until he was about, I don't know, 89. <laughs> uh, um, so, so ask me something else. So I, I was, so I got interested in sociology because I was mm-hmm. interested in systems. I like the whole piece about how uh, how society develops, what trends, and uh, and you and you would read books uh, 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 like the Urban Village, uh, where they talked about what happened when a whole neighborhood was bulldozed out, and how and how the planners just thought about, you know, they thought about improvement meant that improvement for the people that they would like to live there, not the people who live there now. Mm-hmm. So you know they put freeways through people's neighborhoods. Stuff like that, and uh, and so I I was interested in sociology, and then I got interested in social work. Um, so yeah, so combination of uh, uh, and I looked at what was happening in my neighborhood because you can look around, you see there's certain things you just didn't have, and. Uh, um, And so uh, I wanted, I was curious about, you know, what could we do to get systems operating to improve life for our community? One of my buddies had a, uh, in a neighborhood, his dad was the head of the Philadelphia Corps. You know what Corps was? Mm-hmm. Corps was a civil rights organization. You know that? Yes. Okay, yes. it comes to racial equality. So he was the head of it. And he was a mail carrier. Uh, he was a brother from the Sea Islands. He was a Geechee guy. Dark, handsome, handsome, beautiful color. Uh, but Mr. Bryant uh, would take us to to their events. Uh, and so, um, uh, and so I became interested because of you know my dad uh, and the family. My mom, who was uh, 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 who had gone to a one-room school where they had all the grades in school, and they built a new school for black kids when integration came there. <laughs> so that's another story. Uh, Mr. Yes. Bryant, um, you know the thing about it, there were there were vital black men in the neighborhood. Uh, we even had a little street fraternity where we used to go to dances and cut out, and, you know, uh, and we do steps that we would all dance in in sync. And so there was a barber who used to sponsor us, uh, you know. And I um and I'm I'm sure some of that happens now because I saw some kids the other day. They were playing football and there were there were adult black men out there with them. Uh, and so I know that still happens. Uh, it's just that the people who who don't get that stuff, that's the ones you hear about. In any case. Yeah, so how, how did your your desire to create systems in your community that will benefit, you know, the people in your community kind of transfer over into your, active, your role of activism at Penn State, um, knowing that you were, by your senior year, the president of the Douglas Association and knowing that you were a member of your fraternity. So how did how did that desire kind of like transfer over um, into yeah. your extracurricular activities at the university that kind of, that well, not kind of, but made a huge and remarkable, you know, change for a lot of African-American students during your time and even, you know, today? Well, well it, Here's the thing. Each 
each each time I came across someone who was older who was doing one 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 semester I was there. Uh, I think I was still living in West Hall, and about that time, uh, and I was going to eat in the shower hall, and there was this older black woman sitting there, and somebody said to me, "The Rick, you should meet this lady." And it turned out to be, you know who Fannie Lou Hamer was? Mm-hmm. Okay. So she had come to speak. And so I cut class because I spent the whole time just listening to her, talking with her. <coughs> Excuse me. And she told me how how she and her husband registered people to vote, mm-hmm. and the police had beat them to the point where she had a permanent limp. Yeah. And she still kept on strive. When she said, you know, I'm just real sick and tired of being sick and tired. And so that was something she used to say all the time, apparently. Uh, but I got to talk to her and whatnot. And she'd come all the way up from Mississippi to give a talk. And I was just like, man, I said, you know. And you could see what, you could see that she was in pain. And she wasn't that old, maybe in her 40s, 50s, 40s, 50s. Uh, and she was going to go against uh, she'd gone against President Johnson and the Democratic Party and the Mississippi Party and those people those people in Mississippi uh, uh, they were no joke they were scary folks but they were just about as scary as the people in Fishtown really uh, uh, and, you know uh, so um so those sort of folks, as I kind of looked at when I was at when I was at uh, LaSalle, I noticed that the, I noticed that they they seemed to have things that we did. I knew that my dad and mom could not because I heard them talking about it, that they could not get a GI loan to move any place they wanted to in Philly. They could only move in another black neighborhood or neighborhood that was in transition that was going to change. You know, the neighborhood was integrated. It was the time of integration was the time the first black family moved in and the last white family <laughs> left. So that was in between time that was integrated. And so, um, and so I studied these processes and I thought, um, uh, and there, was a, there were a couple of black kids on campus. There's an alpha named John Warner who was in the, the counterparts of the NAACP or whatever. Um, and um, uh, and he said, you know, we need to, you know, this university doesn't do enough. And I just looked at it and I said, um, uh, and they would say to us, um, we don't know how to recruit black students. Black students don't want to come here. Um uh, you know, they even said, they even put an article in the Daily Collegiate. They were talking about how come they had, how, how come they had about the same amount of black students, black ball players as the University of Alabama. Well, we knew the University of Alabama discriminated against folks, mm-hmm. but the people at Penn State actually debated whether or not black kids were smart enough to play football at Penn State. They played football, <laughs> no, no, not to like. Uh, fly a jet plane, not to build a jet plane, but to play football. <laughs> we would, you know, we were smart enough to play football. That was just incredible. And so, um, you know, the term they use now were microaggressions. Yeah. Okay. And so there will always be sort of things that people would say, like, uh, if I repeat before, while I was in the English class and the, uh, and the, and the professor, a Jew, uh, he had this uh, story uh, that he was reading and uh, was having us read, and he said to me, uh, or he said to the class, well, you know, blacks were pretty satisfied with slavery. Uh, I said, no, nah, that's not true. I just knew it wasn't true. And sure enough, my dad my, and his uncle, my great uncle, told me that we had an ancestor who uh, – who, uh, who liberated himself, and he liberated his master's horse. 
and rode from Maryland, because you can get away from Maryland, not from Mississippi. Mm-hmm. He rode from Maryland to Pennsylvania to New York. Uh, there was a fugitive slave law that was passed, and you heard about that, right? Mm-hmm. You just, yeah, the federal government coming to just take you. Well, uh, did you see Harriet? Movie no. Harriet? No, I have not. Oh. <laughs> Dear. <coughs> that, <laughs> listen, that black woman was, she was sharper than James Bond. I don't know what she said. But the feds could come and arrest you and sell you back into slavery. Or mm-hmm. slavers could snatch free people off the street. There was a, a true story called 12 Years of Slave by a mm-hmm. person who was a free so my so my uh my my ancestor had actually changed his name from Brown, because this is a family legend, uh, to Collins because the slave catcher was looking for him because they were thinking that he was named Brown. So he was he was kinda incognito, so to speak. Uh so he changed his name to Collins and he left for Canada. He moved there. And he lived there until uh, until freedom. Okay? And his son, which was another great grand whatever, actually served in the Union Army. Came back across the border, served in the Union Army. And remember, uh, did you ever see the movie Glory? Yes. Another ancient movie. Okay, all right. Okay. So my ancestor, or our ancestor in this family of mine, or my on my uh, dad's side, had actually come back and served in the Union Army, knowing that if he got caught, he would either be sold into slavery or killed or murdered, you know. And so uh, I looked, you know, when I found all that, and so this guy was saying that we were satisfied with slavery, and here I was, just a regular black person who had a history of folk. My mom's mm-hmm. side, people were farmers. They, they, they got land that they owned after they got free, or my dad's people, they ran away. They, they freed themselves, and then they came back and fought for liberation. Those were our people. And so I said that, and, and I actually had another professor who said to me, uh, I don't know, because there was a watch riot, 65, and so he asked me, because I'd be the only one in class, and, and then these guys would pontificate about stuff they didn't know about. So he said, Why are Negroes rioting? Mexican-Americans are poor, and they don't seem to be rioting. Why are you guys Mm -hmm. doing this? And, of course, by that time, uh, one, I had never seen a Mexican. And, two, uh, he didn't know anything about their history of civil rights that the Mexicans Mm -hmm. had. Because in a few years, they became the Chicano movemental. Those guys, they had their own rights. (laughs) But this is even... this is kind of those microaggressions that those guys can say to us. Or the uh or the inner fraternity uh council said to us, you know, why don't you guys all become one fraternity? Because you guys are all colored, you know, why don't you why don't you like all merge into like uh you know, the alphas and the kappas and the keys. We could just be one fraternity. Because why would we not? And then but these uh, these these white guys, it was a sort of a dufosity thing that went on. They just could not see that there were actually Italian fraternities on campus. There were several Jewish fraternities. There some fraternities that spread toward Catholic. They had all these different white fraternities, and for some reason, they could not see that uh, uh, white. Well, you know, you know, we were all the same anyway. Mm-hmm. So. Um, uh, and so each 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 summer when I went back, where I would work in a factory or whatever, but each time I would pick up something, you know, I go to I go to Black Power Conference. They had them in Philly, or um, a friend of mine was doing um, some community work down in South Philly at the uh, down Seventh and Emily, where there was a a, a black community down there. So I would go down there and we'd, we'd run classes. So each time I was always doing that stuff, learning new stuff. And 
and my older family members would give me more information about what we'd done. And, you know, it, and, and I say that because, you know, we were just regular folk. But just being regular folk, my folks actually, you know, like many millions of our people, had actually stood on the, on the high quarters and, you know, and resisted. Um, and, and Mrs. Hamer just, uh, she just influenced me greatly, greatly. And so one of the things about Penn State, because they had all this money, they would bring people up to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, you ever remember a book called The Invisible Man? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, Ralph Ellison came up to speak. And so, and so I got to meet him because, you know, uh, he was going to speak and then he speak, spoke at the hub, uh, uh, and, you know, and so you would get to see these folks come to speak. Uh, Muhammad Ali came up to speak one time and he had a, you know, but that came later. Um, 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 I think that, uh, after Doctor uh, After Doctor King had gotten killed, um, things came to a head. Now, within the black community itself, the 215 or 225, there was a lot of there was a lot of debate about the whole black black power movement. Uh, but there was debate about growing Afro. I remember when I grew my first Afro. I went home, uh, and I got in the house. My parents made me go around and cut it all off. Because <laughs> I remember uh, one of the neighbors said, well, you know, you know, uh, Ricky has his hair grown long. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and she said, don't worry. That's going to be cut soon. I'll give him 30 minutes. <laughs> but... But uh, let me just add this. When, um, uh, for me, being able to go to Penn State, so that in spite of the fact that the elementary schools I went to, they didn't think we were smart enough to uh, be involved in advanced placement programs at all, or the high school uh, uh, uh you know, there were many folks in administration who didn't want us there. I was still able to be there. And uh, I remember the Irish guy who owned the hardware store up the street from us. Um, remember, when my family moved on to the street, none of the white adults ever invited my my parents into their house. Never. And I don't even know if they spoke to him. I don't know if they, I don't know, you know, because we had Mrs. Taylor, the first black family, so we knew her. <laughs> she was on the other side. And as, but, uh, and I would sometimes play with the kids on the street, but um, none of them ever came by our house. Never, never. And it was one of those long, narrow streets, Matthew Street, never. But when, uh, so the the guy owned the hardware store who lived in our street. He had moved, and he he said to my mother one time, he said, "Did Ricky finish high school?" He said, "Well, yeah, he's a freshman at Penn State or sophomore, and he was downcast because his son hadn't gone to college. His white Irish son had, you know, impregnated some girl, got married. Okay, uh, and." Uh, uh, and this was before where people would just, you know, if you got a girl pregnant, then you're going to get married to her back then. Uh, so uh, um, so for me, the idea of being able to, going back to, uh, that we had a right to be at these places. Mm-hmm. And we, I started to see that we had built up stuff, that we were not, we, would, we were not guests. Uh, and you started to see the the pattern of, you know, sometimes you have some writers, especially other people of color, 
say that the people should forget about the white and black binary. But what they don't understand is the white and black binary will always exist because the whiteness is the standard, and then we're another standard. Uh, mm-hmm. So that when I was a, when I was a kid, Italians were looked down on, and they were being converted into being accepted as white people. Same thing with Jewish folks. So that you see Jewish folks and Italians intermarry and live with other white people in ways they didn't, even when I was a kid. Uh, And when other people of color came in, they were encouraged to not associate with us. So no matter if the other struggles, because, you know, white Americans have been busy oppressing all types of people, no matter, you know, we were always the standard to not be part of. Uh, So it's no coincidence that, you know, um, the trash pickups were different. Uh, The fact that uh, I found out from one, and that's just one example in our our community, our playground, we didn't didn't have as much. You could actually see that. And, uh, and And then when I found out that Penn State actually went to some school districts and recruited, just mm-hmm. not where we live. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so how, oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so go ahead. No, ask your question. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, ask about the, the, knowing that you, you had a right to be at the university, knowing that you belong there. Um, how did the 13 demands come about and why was that pushed so hard? Um, with you, as as I mentioned, being the president of the Douglas Association, not at the time, but a year following when the 13 demands were, yeah. you know, right. sent out, yeah. how did right. that kind of, you so know, push Fred you Phillips. into it? Fred Phillips, who was the, uh, who was a year ahead of me at LaSalle and then he went to Penn State. Uh, uh, um, Fred had pulled together a meeting of uh, the different, you know, five of the divine nine, and we tried to get a uh, couple of independents. But independent folks were like, uh, most of them were fellas, and they 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 were often not connected with other folks. So so I wanted to go, you know, to represent the cues at the at Fred's meeting where. And he said, you know, we needed to get together to uh, an organization to, to to represent us and 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 this, that, and the other. Um, and he said, you know, uh, you know, we wanted to know how we felt about it. And he said, well, you know, um, we're going to call it the Frederick Douglass Association because of that time we didn't want to put a he didn't want to call us the Negro Students Organization or something. <coughs> and some of the folks have been upset about being white. And then we didn't know if the university would accept that, even though there were all types of organizations on, you know, there was Haleo, which was for Jews, and there were like, you know, Arab Americans. They had that stuff. Uh, so, uh, so we went to the uh, president's house and he gave us this horrible uh, pie that we ate and Fred was going to be our spokesman and we could all ask questions and, and the dean who was an immigrant from England England, he said to us well you know I don't see how things are so bad look, look I'm an immigrant you know I had it hard just like you guys did and I'm thinking, this guy must be crazy. He's from England. And he's not like, uh, he's, 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 we're not talking about an England looking like, I, I just, uh, what's the brother's name? The actor. Idris. 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 <laughs> yeah. He wasn't one of, he wasn't that brother. He was a white guy. And, uh, and so it got around that as we talked to him, I mean, he, spent maybe an hour or two with him on Sunday. And there were about, oh, maybe six of us split between men and women. 
it was pretty clear to me that he wasn't telling us anything. So uh, so we left. Fred went on. Fred went on to um, uh, to an undergraduate uh, internship. So he was gone in the spring of 60, 60, uh, 68, was gone. And that, and when Dr. King was murdered and the governor of the state, a Republican, was going to have all the flags and half staff, Penn State just didn't want to do it. So that's when we broke the locks off the state of the federal flag. Because we had a, we had a, let me put it like this. When Dr. King was murdered, we went up to Old Main and we had a kind of a ceremony. And we were talking and there was, there were some folks who were really, everybody, some folks were really upset. Uh, I myself was kind of numb to that because I really wasn't sure about that nonviolence thing. And of course I got to know more about who King was and, you know, his strengths and his portable. That was years later. So that's when he looked and saw the flags weren't taken down. And so we were just angry, angry. And so, uh, and so all the fellas rushed to break off the, break the locks. And I went to the, I went to the state flag and I didn't know what it was. Uh, I said, what's that flag? That's a state flag. So, so I broke the locks and I lowered that. And I was looking up, I heard all this hustle because there's some of these white guys from Kappa Sig or some of these other white fraternities rushed up to defend America. And I watched them while they were getting their butts whipped. They got their butts whipped. <laughs> and the flag stayed down. The school threatened retaliation against us, but then, you know, said you didn't respect Dr. King, said or whatnot. And so that's when we sat down and said, uh, you know, we met with them in the fall and nothing happened. So that's when we came up with the demand, the 13 demand. Um, and within that were, you know, all the things we wanted more of us there. We wanted professors. Uh, we wanted counselors. We wanted folks on the team. We wanted a sister to be a cheerleader. We wanted all of that. We wanted, we, because we felt um, that, uh, that our parents had contributed to this place Every year, every year, my parents, my aunts and uncles, my cousins, anybody who was a grown-up, me, whenever I I paid, never had one of my jobs. But it was as if, you know, we were like, like we didn't work deserving. So that Mm -hmm. gap, you know, happened between the spring and the fall. I had run for vice president of the association. So they devised a structure and they devised a way that everybody could vote on, you know. Uh, and then when we take, and then um, um, we had not gotten a response to our demands at all. The school was just, they gave us some flunky, you know, vice president who just kind of gaffed us up. And, uh, and I think when I came back from, because we were on the term system then. Uh, you could graduate in three years on the term system. We were on the term system. I came back from winter break. I found out that the that the person, a guy named Will, had dropped out of school. And so all of a sudden, I was the president. <laughs> <laughs> and so and so then at that in between, the uh, Harrisburg Ten had come up. Mm-hmm. And Harrisburg Penn, uh, you know, at that time, I barely knew about Harrisburg. Because, you know, we came in on a bus, and I barely knew that. I, I saw that there were some black folks there, but then there was this kind of black movement going on there. And these kids were folks that uh, Kaylee Ward Irvis and other folks, you know, uh, 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 they, were, they were admitted over the summer. They, mm-hmm. they uh they tried to not give them any classification, but then they were, but then they were still around in the fall, and so they had to make them fresh. So they were really militant. And there were other folks, and they said, people came and said, Rick, they haven't listened to us. What should we do? And so I kept thinking about it. I said, well, we got to do something. 
Uh, and that's when we found out that uh, the coach, uh, Joe Paterno, had just started, and he'd actually gone to a ball, bowl game. But before that, we had some coach named Rip Engel, who was the one who was talking about saying that maybe black kids weren't small enough to play football. That still wrangled to play football. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, they were having this big celebration of the school winning this football game, beating the University of Missouri. And so when uh, – and the place was packed, but we all sat together. And when the clapping stopped, we stayed up with our, in our group with our, with our right fist held up high. And then the Penn Staters got upset. They were booing us and stuff like that. So in the middle of Joe Paterno's speech, if you were listening to it on your black and white TV or color TV or just on the radio, it looked at his, uh Joe Paterno was uh, was getting booed. And so so we made sure that we got the sisters out first, but we marched out. And then um and then we kinda followed. You know? I think some guy tried to push me but I uh, but I made in my mind I wasn't going to punch him in the face because, you know, there was only but two of us. And plus the fact of the matter was we had made our impact. And so that's kind of when all that stuff started. Uh, and that's when I called my parents and and let them know what was going on. And I said, you know, pop this stuff here. And, you know, so that's when my mother said, you should find, can't you find somebody else to do this? And I said, let me talk to pop. <laughs> And then he, of course, was supportive. He said, you know. So then, so what happened was that um, we always did things on a collective, you know, because we made sure we had we had the offices. But then we would have meetings so that we could get, we could plan. And, and it occurred to me after one of the daily collegian reporters was assigned to us, we had to do something every week. We had to do an action. Every week we had to do something, no matter what it was. I looked at the collegian. You can look at it on a microfiche. And I, and, I, and I looked at it. I said, damn, I didn't know we did all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I said to myself, I mean, uh, uh, and we, we had, we had, uh, we had, uh, we had demonstrations in Old Main, two of them, three of them. We had demonstrations in the computer building. We had demonstrations up the middle of the street. We had, uh, uh, we would disrupt stuff. <laughs> uh, and, um, and, you know, for the most part, I got support from the from the fraternity brothers. Some of the older guys, they were just trying to they were just trying to get through because there were some folks who were fifty year seniors. Okay, mm-hmm. there were some folks I didn't know, but but they punched out, as we called it, uh, punched out because they had these computer cards which would have all your stuff on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of you guys don't have now, and so they punched that card and they punched out. Well, okay. Uh, uh, throughout that time, I was uh, uh, we were planning actions. We were trying to make sure that uh, that our white allies, uh, whether it was the um, SDS, didn't try to tell us what to do because uh, they wanted us to to do things. You know, like so. If there was a big demonstration at Old Main. Uh, uh, and the whites actually believed, they actually believed that black, blacks would not get beat up by the cops. I knew better because my old man, he got beaten up by the cops. He got beaten up by the cops. They beat him up bad. So I knew this. And so I would get all the black students out when, the, when, the, uh, when they came out with a foghorn and said, you have 15 minutes to get out of here. Then I got every black student out because I knew one of the things that scared kids was that they would be busted and they would lose their time. 
And there were some folks who would say, you know, Rick, I don't remember that bus that we took down to Harrisburg. I said, because your mama told you and your pop said you couldn't go. That's why you don't <laughs> remember it. <laughs> you didn't go. You didn't go. Um, so oh. out of your um, your many, you know, protests and demonstrations that were held, could you describe describe one of the most impactful protests or demonstrations that was held that you were able to lead? Okay. So I'll 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 uh, well I think I told you about um I told you about the time we took a busload of students down to Harrisburg and we met in the we were supposed to meet the governor but he got out of town. But there were police all over the place and and that's when my relatives in Pittsburgh uh, were calling me because they got my picture and they wanted to. So as far as my brothers in Pittsburgh were concerned, even now they think that I was uh, militant. I guess I was. That was a term we used. Never liked using that much, but you know, it was a there was a term that was, that was one word: black militant. Um, mm-hmm. There was a time that uh, you know with, uh, where we were meeting in the. We all met at the Q house. The Q house was my center of stuff. We met at the Q house. And and we had football players and African students and all these different folks. And so we walked out of the Q House with our bricks, walked straight down uh, South Allen Street, up Old Main, went into the building. Engineering students had us build bricks and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so what would happen is when we would do these things, we would get uh, they would they would say they would tell us that they couldn't get a uh, a black studies class. Then all of a sudden they drafted the one black guy. <laughs> they had one tenured professor to teach a black English class. And they mm-hmm. had a guy who was in the state department teach a class on African. And then they had a and then they had a uh, a Kenyan uh, PhD student teach a Swahili class. So all these things that they told us were impossible uh, between winter and spring and term, they had them. They got them. And so then I knew that they were, uh, at the time, that they were, that they were, that they were, that they were Barbosa, Spanish term. Barbosa means jerk. They were just jerks. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. But they lied to us. That they would always tell us they couldn't get these. Just like they couldn't, you know, we don't know how to recruit in Philly and Pittsburgh. And so we actually got some folks who came out from Pittsburgh were reaching out to them, and they wanted to meet with us. Uh, so it's kind of hard to say. I remember uh, if I thought things were going too slow, I think my last demonstration, we disrupted the computer center, threw stuff around and stuff. Years later, I met with the class of 89. They've actually destroyed stuff in the computer center. We kind of compared mm-hmm. notes at 20. Cause we just kicked stuff around. Um, and there was there were some there were some allies, some black ones who were PhD students, uh, and uh, we would go to any of the black folks who were in position. So if Ted Thompson was head of the um, the you know the student government, student government mm-hmm. uh, then we would get support from that. If uh, Clark Harrington was head of the jazz club, you know, for, he would give us discounts or not even discounts, he'd give us free tickets and set the black students up, at least the activists. And that would mm-hmm. be, and so we kept it so that we had a good range of folks. It wasn't just four or five folks, although it may have seemed like it was just one. We would have uh, teachers where I would speak, uh, and the place would be full of students. But the goal was not supposed to be about me, but, but to talk about you know, our demands and and what we needed because we were real people. Mm-hmm. When the uh, fraternity dressed up, uh, have you ever met anybody from Fiji? No. Fiji? Oh, okay. Beautiful black folks. But it was a fraternity called itself Fiji, and they used to dress up in bones and uh, dress skirts and these kind of wigs, some of the stuff they still do uh, at some campuses I heard, mostly in the south. Mm-hmm. So they would they would parade around, 
And and I went to the inner fraternity council because I was an Omega. And they said to us, you know, that's a tradition. I said, listen, if you dress like that, I cannot guarantee the safety of your members. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's pretty straight up. I cannot yeah. guarantee the safety of your members. And so then they painted themselves blue or purple. We didn't care then. If you've ever met the Fijian, they're beautiful black folk. All look like football players. One time I saw these sisters in California who from Fiji. I mean, boy, they were just like, boom. They were just off the chain. Beautiful. And uh, uh, and I met the president from Fiji. They're, they're black folk. And so... Uh, uh, that whole thing where folks, you know, uh, would do things, it's like the Redskins ball team, you know, stuff like that. Uh, people say, well, it's tradition, so we could dress like that. And the Fijians aren't savages. Fijians had, were noble people. Uh, they fought in World War II. Got the Victoria Cross, which is like a Medal of Honor. Uh, and the uh, First Nations people, they don't deserve to have a team named after them with the head of one of their folks because uh, that's hurtful. That's hurtful. Uh, uh, so I, I think that uh, when we had the uh, when we had our Black Arts Festival, mm-hmm. uh, we had two things. We had a discussion thing that was a kind of a set off for it. And then we had the Black Arts Festival. One of the things that I noticed, this is God's truth. He could come up with things like the Black Arts Festival, other things. But if sisters weren't running it, Mm -hmm. it wasn't going to (laughs) happen. It wasn't going to happen. And, of course, things have changed because, you know, it was always this thing that the brothers had to be out front. Now that's, you know, that ain't happening because yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, because I noticed two black women, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, Lucy Collins, that's three, really, uh, my mom. And I ran as a delegate for Shirley Chisholm. Remember her? Mm-hmm. You know who she was? Okay. Yes. Well, I ran as a delegate for her when she was running for president. I got to meet her. She's strong. She's a, just a little, little Bajan, uh, Barbadian woman. She was strong. So we started to see with Black Lives Matter uh, uh, and all of these strong black women, uh, including my granddaughter and my daughter, uh, that we see now, just running stuff, just running stuff. Black Lives Matter, three, four black women. Black women who are immigrants, black women who are who are uh, LGBTQ folks, uh, lesbian folks, um, black women who are straight folks, black women with sorority sisters. I mean, so uh, anytime I turn on any of these TV shows, I see young black women like me, some a few years older, some the same age. Hell, there was a 12, 13-year-old who uh, organized a Black Lives Matter thing. And Dr. King's granddaughter gave that presentation when they were uh, talking about saving their lives. When this, uh, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, yeah. So one of the things that I, that I looked at that I always saw that where folks with uh, whites and people who, who wanted to be like whites, would always say that we were the best country in the world. And I would say, folks, have you ever been someplace else? Do you know that? Mm -hmm. But I said, if you want us to be the best in the world, then we have to honor these things. You have to honor these things. Uh, And I think, um, and I, and I think, and I think we are, I think we've been very considerate of white folks. Because somebody white will say to me, well, Rick, uh, so-and-so, uh, 
told me everything was fine. I said, it was lying to you. Didn't want it to feel it. Mm. So everything ain't fine. From the time I couldn't get my hair cut right around the corner to the time they wouldn't let me become an altar boy. Now, I didn't realize then, but that was uh, the only time that racism actually benefited me. But you know what happened to all the boys <laughs> yeah. later on with the Catholic Church. Yeah. But we didn't know that then. Um, um, I think that uh, when they did increase from 200-something uh, to 800, um, somebody said to me, well, Rick, you know, a lot of those 800, they weren't qualified to be here. Mm-hmm. So what makes you think all those white people were qualified? Those thousands of white kids. What did you think so? I said, you know, I'm not going to worry about that because because uh, we have built this state. We built this university. We bring money into it. You know? um, but I got to meet some folks, um, people that I would never have met if I hadn't gone to Penn State, especially some black folks especially some strong black um, Yeah. When, yeah, so, uh, what's that? No, no, go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. No, you say it. What you say? Yeah. no I was going to ask um, just a, a later question, but you can go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Do that. Ask me the question. So that is oh. small. Yeah, <laughs> you answered quite all, almost every, you know, question that I could have possibly think, thought about. Um, even in, you know, creating the questions for this interview and for this project. But just to wrap up, um, I do have a final, uh, some final questions about, you know, lifetime sure. memories and, and your legacy that you left at Penn State. Um, being that I am a kind of a beneficiary of some of the things that you, you know, you protested and demonstrated for and you demanded out of the university. Um, last time we talked, you mentioned um, and echoed uh, what former Congressman um, John Lewis said: "Good trouble and necessary trouble." Yeah, and when you look, right, when you right. look back um, over your time at Penn State and, and even where you are now, um, do do you do you think that your demonstration and, and your your you know your involvement and your activism at the university was good and necessary trouble that has now continued on to present day um, opportunities for African-American students um, who, who attend Penn State? Well, this is how I look at it. Every generation, there is somebody in our, in our community um, that makes good trouble. Every generation. Uh, one time those guys couldn't get haircuts in 1960. Why was going to mm-hmm. get the haircuts at Penn State? And so they actually you know, uh, had demonstrations in front of the barbershops. So then we came after that. And then there was a demonstration that after I left that they had in the middle uh, halftime at Penn State. Mm-hmm. Then there was something else. So um, 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 so I think that, that that's a natural thing of our role in this country. Is to uh, is to cause good trouble, to cause good trouble, good trouble. So um, uh, uh, when um, my daughter and granddaughter marched in the Black Lives Matter demonstration in Arlington, in fact, they organized things that are dealing with the schools down there and with the uh, police department, the police department. Um, um, and so uh, I'm proud of that. I um, I uh, I didn't go to those demonstrations here, but I say to folks, there's 46 million of us in this country now. 46. So we ain't going nowhere. 46 million is a lot of people. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, yeah, so, um, my, so my final, I, yeah, my final question for I'll you as we wrap, wrap up and, you know, 
kind of end the the oral history if you would summarize your college experience in one phrase or word what would it be and why oh uh, uh life affirming a growth period because i went from uh um I felt that I could uh, do anything, and I always had to, you know, um, I had a lady friend used to say, I don't have to have my way, but I have to have my say. And so I have to have my say about, you know, how I see things. And that can be about stuff at Penn State or if I'm filing a case on, or if I'm working with a sexual assault victim and I and I have to, file a case about the person who assaulted her. You know, you have to keep, you have to do stuff so you don't harm anybody. Mm-hmm. You, know, you got to do good stuff. And, um, and, you know, um, and, you know, my mother was uh, a head of the state N- NAACP in Virginia. And my, 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 one of my uh, ancestors was a union soldier. So, you know, we stand on the shoulders of good folks, good folks. Um, and I told you one time about that Major Mosley, a guy who mm-hmm. never got anything for what he did, but he wanted us. In fact, by having a stand with him, that's probably why he never got promoted. Mm-hmm. But that's, I mean, that's a role. That's a role. Uh, you know? So, nah. So folks who don't want to do anything, or folks who complain about it, I don't have much time. Mm. You know, and you know, uh, my daughter was living in South Africa. Had my grandkids in South Africa. Uh, uh, and one of the reasons he went there because. I was telling her stuff just like I was, my dad and mom were telling me. Uh, my sister didn't want to go to South Africa. And my son, done, <laughs> he's happy being in uh, California. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but look, the legacy is, you know, as long as I leave a legacy that my, uh, my family members, extended mm-hmm. family, close family, that they can say, you know, that uh, Rick was a person who cared about us and listened listened to us, and uh, he never did anything that uh, caused us to be ashamed of him. You know, that was it. That's yeah, it. And, and and legacy is so important, and I know for myself just even having the opportunity to, you know, inter- interview you and hear your story and, and just see how I have been able to benefit from the different ways that you, like I said, demonstrated the different ways that you advocated on the behalf of um, African-American students and created new systems for African-American students at the Pennsylvania State University. It, you, you have left a, a legacy and your legacy to still continues on today and will continue on even after, um, you know, this year and for, from years on end. So I just want to say thank you so much, Mr. Collins, for taking the time to just um, to be interviewed and, and share your story. Well, thank you.